This is video history from the J. Bay Jacobs Library for the History of Obstetrics and Gynecology in America. It's a pleasant spring afternoon in San Francisco in the year 2005. And my guest today is Dr. Richard Hollis, the past president of ACOG and a guest that we're most delighted to have with us. Uh, everybody knows you as Pete. It's okay if I call you Pete? That's fine. Uh, historically, we've begun at the beginning. Um, so uh, tell us about your early years, uh, where you were born, where you grew up, what things led you toward medicine. I was born in the town where I practiced, in Amory, Mississippi. Mississippi. Home birth, front bedroom of the house, <laughs> third of three sons. Probably subliminally, I was influenced by the fact that my oldest brother died right after birth. Mm. And then my second brother died at age two from pneumonia. Because for some reason, all my life, I wanted to be a doctor. In fact, when I applied at Tulane, the dean said, uh, when did you decide you want to study medicine? I said, I always have. And he hammered on that and hammered on that and finally said, well, I guess so, Hollis. <laughs> and he said, why? I said, I just want to be a doctor. Well, he finally says, all right, I believe you do. So I, I did, I was able to get in. Uh, I grew up in Amory and uh, finished uh, high school there, went to Mississippi State and then to Tulane. How big a town is Amory? Well, it's uh, about eight shy of 7,000. <laughs> <laughs> I did go in the Navy between high school and, uh, and college. What years uh, would that have been? 1940, spring of 45. And you finished high school? Yes, I finished. Uh -huh. I, got, I was in in April. Uh, I did have to that do is... something that you can appreciate because you and I are both colorblind. That's true. Five of us played ball together and we were going to go in the Navy and I found out I was colorblind so I had to buy a book bootleg on Front Street of Memphis, Tennessee and I memorized it <laughs> in order to get in the Navy. Of course, we didn't stay together. They thought we were. But uh, nevertheless, after I finished Tulane, I... That, what year would that have been? I finished Tulane in 52. 52. Then I okay. t had an internship and in my residence there at Charity Hospital on the Tulane service. Went back in the service during the Korean conflict in, in the Air Force mm -hmm. and was in Wichita Falls, Texas. I did spend 18 months in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and a pediatrician who had been my son. Now, was that in the military? No, sir. That oh, was no. after I got okay. When you were done. Right. And a uh, pediatrician who'd been my Sunday school teacher begged me to come back to Amory to deliver babies. Well, I labored and labored with it and uh, finally decided to, and I'm so thankful I did. Because when I went back to Amory, you know, somebody said, oh, you can't go home. Well, it's not <laughs> true. I was able to you take care of the, the mothers, the wives, the sisters, the grandmothers, the daughters of the boys I had grown mm -hmm. up with. and. Uh, had a great time. Tell me a little bit about your military service and, and your, your medical practice in those times. Well, what were the years? I was a, a seaman in World War II, so that, okay. uh, was, that was before that, that's right. medicine. And I was, were you on shipboard? I fought the Battle of, Bain, of uh, Chesapeake Bay, right okay. close to right. <laughs> Bainbridge. Right out of Norfolk, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, when I went in the service, and I will have to tell you this, you, you may want to delete this, but we were classified as uh, a veteran not subject to draft. In World War II, if you served more than 90 days during wartime okay. and then became a physician, you didn't have to go to the Korean conflict. However, although I was in longer than that, I was in only 86 days of wartime, <laughs> so I was the only physician in the state of Mississippi eligible to go to the Korean conflict. And I received this, this notice, and I called up this lady. She says, Doc, said, Dr. Hollis, you better come home. 
says, I tell you what, the, the four on the five on the draft board, two of them don't think you ought to go, two of them think you do, and the head of the draft board is the one that's going to make the decision. Says you need to come talk to him. Well, I only needed, I like about ten months of my residency finishing. Mm -hmm. So I came home, and the man was out on a sidestep tractor with a band down on a straw hat. He made two or three rounds, and he says, Hollis, you trying to get out of going to the Army? I said, no, sir. He said, well, let me ask you something. You finished high school in Lane, Virginia? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's 12 years. He says, you got a degree at Mississippi State. That's four. I said, well, no, sir. I, I, I did it in three. He said, don't make no never mind. It counts four. <laughs> then you were at Tulane four years. Then you interned a year. You've had two years. You want another one. He says, oh, Dr. So-and-so, in the late 1800s, spent two years, came back, he's 90 and still treating us. <laughs> I want to know something, Hollis, are you passing or failing? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was finally convinced him I was passing and he did defer me uh, based on the fact that he knew my father and my father's word was good. So what, that's- what, what year was that, would that, that have been? That was in 56. 56. When I went in the service. Mm -hmm. And we were Wichita Falls. I was very fortunate. They decided to do the this is a kind of a training area for men in, going in general duty officers and asked me to set up a program. So we'd bring them in I'd, for 60 days. I'd try to teach them basic obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, the interesting thing about that, why that happened, I, when I went in the service, I had not gone through gunner, so I was in civilian clothes. They would not let me have a uniform list they could get one on base and for my height you had to be way about 350 pounds to fit. <laughs> so they finally let me out of summer uniform and I had had no training I walked out and the sergeant says now captain you've got to salute everybody that's a major above. I said all right I'll do that. So I walked right out to the women's clinic and here comes this lieutenant colonel and I said morning how you feeling? <laughs> So I got put on the port. You're starting. <laughs> well, that night, as I was, when I was trained, uh, we had to make morning rounds, evening rounds, and fever rounds. Fever rounds if anybody was sick. So I was making rounds, and this lady was coming down this old Army-type hospital, blood streaming just like the middle part of a highway. And we were right by the women's ward. And I said, can I help you? She said, I hope so said, I'm having a miscarriage, and there's a psychiatrist in the emergency room, a dermatologist over here, and this is my second trip. So <clears throat> I said, come on in, and she fainted, and I picked her up. And there was a sergeant from Mobile, Allen. I saw him, I met him, I said, Allen, come quick, I need some help. And I told him, get me some IV, get me some air mm -hmm. get a sponge stick, get me some gloves and all that. So we just had a or had a curtain off and I was working and he punched me. He says, Doctor, doc, you've got to listen. I said, what? So here's this nurse who's a major. She says, Captain Hollis? I said, yes, ma'am. You can't treat this patient here. She hadn't been admitted. <laughs> I said, are you a nurse? She said, I sure am. I said, well, you either get in here and help me or get out of the way. So <clears throat> the next morning, I was on report again. The only one that had been, had been on report <laughs> twice in 24 hours, and the colonel called me in. And Anyway, he wanted to know what to do, and I said, let's us set up a separate call. You've got five general duty officers assigned to me, and when we're on OB call, we'll just take care of the women's problem in the clinic and uh, in the emergency room. And we developed a real good relationship, and, and he realized I was going to take care of women, and from that, that's when they set up this kind of a compacted a compact course which I enjoyed we had anesthesia and medicine and everybody else had play a part in that did you do your your military career there uh, two years yes. two years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure did what happened after that uh, well you you'd had practice experience before you were no I went straight from residency. straight from residency yes. okay and it was a good transition from charity hospital to, to private practice which is quite different yes it's quite different <laughs> But I was, in, I was in Tuscaloosa for 18 months, and a uh, very nice town. Uh, but I just really kind of wanted to go back home. 
I always did. And when this opportunity came, I went back home and uh, pediatrician and I started to practice. Were there other obstetricians in the town then? No, sir. I was the, the first I practiced, one. Practiced by myself so. for seven years. Hmm. And that was that's that's hard work. But when a patient called, I knew the color of her eyes, I knew her RH yeah. and all the whole works. So it was it was real good. Mm -hmm. And then as I worked there, when I left, uh, there were six. And when I retired, there were six in our practice. We had a neonatologist, and we had four other pediatricians, and a lot of other specialties. So at one time, uh, we four of us delivered 1,200 babies in one year. Ooh. So that's a busy. We had a that's large, a busy practice. A large drawing that, area. That's right. Now, you were concentrated in one area, yet everybody from that area of the country seems to know you. How did you get known all through the area? Was this, you know, in terms of organized medicine, or was it patient referrals, or just kind of everything? Well, I tell you, when the first year I was there, Warren, from the amount of money I had when I first went there till I, after the end of the 12 months, I lost $375. <laughs> because the other doctors would send me nothing but patients so were, that were not were, going to pay, this, that, and the other. And, and early in the second year, this very prominent lady from another town came in and said, Dr. Hollis, I, I need a hysterectomy. I want you to do it. I said, well, who sent you over? He says, I, nobody. I said, well, who's your doctor? She told me, I said, well, I'll have to call him. So I called him. I said, sure, that's fine. You, you go ahead, Hollis. Well, she had a complete pelvic prosodentia. Hmm. And so he I, was happy to see her in your care, yeah. So I, I, and we got through. And I told her, yes, ma'am, you do need this. And then I says, may I ask you a personal question? She says, certainly. I said, why did you select me? You can go anywhere in the country. She said, well, you know, we have a large business. And I'm in there frequently, and a lot of these people that come in and talk <laughs> about how good you are to them and how much better they feel, they're not paying you because they're not paying me. And says, you're going to do a good operation on me because I'm going to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that lady, uh, her first name was Apple. I won't tell you her last name, but yeah. she referred so many people to me. It was just, uh, it was just yeah. really uh, the turning point. From how far away did she come? You. Well, she didn't live but about 20 miles, okay. but I took, uh, I had the opportunity to take care of people uh, in a radius of 75 miles. 32% of my practice was uh, from Alabama. 32% of the practice was from the Columbus area. So mm -hmm. we had, uh, but you know, I tell you, you knew this. If medicine was something I loved, I didn't go to work. And I That's take, right. yeah. I just, uh, I enjoyed taking care of people. And, and uh, they, I always said the patients were good to me. Gosh, they were. <laughs> so it was, and you know, if you treat people like you'd like your wife treated or my mother mm -hmm. treated or whatever, they, they, they know yeah. that. And then they're going to, mm -hmm. and then the, then the doctors uh, started sending me patients mm -hmm. because I could do surgery that they had not done. How did you get involved with the college? It, your, yours is not the typical description of no. the professorial type uh, sort of thing. Well, when I was uh, at Tulane uh, and interviewed for medical school, Woody Beecham was one of those that interviewed me and then applied for residency and interviewed me. And he was always talking about the college. In fact, he wanted me to stay down there and practice with he and Dan and, and teach and I, I, mm -hmm. I always wanted to teach but I said well I think I want to go home nevertheless <clears throat> I was at a meeting one night in Tupelo at the North Mississippi Medical Society and things were not going too well and uh, they needed somebody as a president and Swan Burris says I know who can turn this around I nominate Pete Hollis and before I knew it I had a job <laughs> And then from that, it went on up to the state and then the uh, vice chair of Mississippi. And, and, and I, one of the first people I ever encountered in an office was Warren Pierce in Knoxville. And you were very encouraging to me. I remember that. And uh, you asked me how, how I was approaching this. I said, well, 
I'm just going to do the best job I can at, this, at what I've assigned. And you said, well, are you thinking about something in the future? And I said, no, nah, I don't think you ought to think about the future for that. Just do the best you can with what, you, what you're supposed to do. And it just kind of kept going. But certainly, um, as the years passed, everybody in that geographic area seemed to know you. So I'm sure you reached out in, in a lot of well, different ways. Well, we were, we were active and uh, tried to be active in the church and in the community and, and in the health planning councils yes. and stuff like that. How did, how did you get actively involved in ACOG, has moved up that kind of ladder? Well, you know, when you become uh, vice chair of the section and then uh, chair of the section, then uh, I was in uh, Wichita, Kansas, and uh, Harry Jonas and Dan Thornton mm -hmm. approached me. Mm -hmm. And uh, there had been a, a doctor who had resigned a position and they needed somebody to serve as uh, vice chair of the district. And they asked me, would I do it? And <clears throat> my only reservation was that uh, Wheezy wasn't there. And I usually consult her before <laughs> I do a thing. But I couldn't, she was off with the girls and I couldn't get in touch with her. I said, well, we'll try it. So that's, that's how I got into that. And, uh, what, what years years did you serve on the executive board? Oh, well, I, approximately I, I, will do. <laughs> I served on the executive board the last three years that you were executive director. Okay. Now, what was that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> that was about uh, ninety to ninety-three, eighty-nine no, no, to ninety-two. I, I think I. I it might have been, uh, I think, 90 to 91. I believe it's 87 okay. to 91. It sounds like 88 to 91. And then you were president. Where yes, sir. Yes, sir. Where did the, I mean, obviously everybody liked you and obviously you deserved it. How did the, how did the impetus come that led to your running for president? I, I didn't run. You didn't run? No. Uh, the district... At that, if you'll remember, at that time, we were getting involved in a lot of the health care issues. Yes. And I was at the district meeting, and uh, somebody called me out, and it was a ruse. I didn't know what it was, but I went out, uh -huh. and they said, oh, we've got the wrong person. <laughs> and I go back in. And, <laughs> and you've so been nominated. <laughs> when I got back, uh, they said, Pete said, uh, we want to run you for president of the college. I said, you're crazy. I said, they're not going to elect us generalist from Mississippi with all these professors and everybody yeah. but they said well you've been teaching residents and this was something that had been a blessing. Wynn Weiser called me up mm -hmm. and asked me if I would teach residents to do vaginal surgery. So for 15 years a resident from Jackson would rotate through my office for three months with that mm -hmm. particular purpose in mind and uh, I had had involvement with the educational committee at the university and uh, things like that. So I had had some relationship right. with that. And anyway, they said, yes, you, you've got a dual role and we need you. The fellowship needs you because we've got to really get s some involvement in a practicing physician. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm not campaigning. Y'all are going to have <laughs> to do this. So uh, believe it or not, uh, I was elected. Mm -hmm. I believed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what, what did you see as the uh, key things that happened during your presidential year, that, uh, things well, that have stayed with us? And I think the most significant thing, or one that, thing that took most of my time was the health care initiative, mm -hmm. if you remember, of the mm -hmm. Clintons. And I, I spent a lot of time, I, I was in, at the White House, uh, all nine, ten, eleven times. And uh, I had uh, times when I'd be back in Amory, and in Sunday night, start seeing patients Monday, and Dee Dee Myers would call and said, we need you in Washington tomorrow. And then I have to go. The thing that I think was the most significant was the involvement of our patients. The first time we met with Judy Fetter, mm -hmm. She says, now, you're not going to get access to patients unless you're primary care physicians, and you're not primary care physicians. 
Well, we certainly we certainly didn't agree with that. No, no. and you, yeah, women in Mississippi would have to wait 18 months if they had to go through a family practitioner, an internist. Well, we wrestled with it and wrestled with it. Didn't know how to get to them. Then I thought of something that I had done with uh, an insurance company in Alabama. They told all the school teachers and the state employees that they could no longer come to Mississippi for their care. And we talked to them and got nowhere. So one day, I, it just occurred to me, I said, why don't you patients call the insurance company? Well, after about two weeks, they called. The insurance says, company was tired of hearing. <laughs> says, you're, you're back in. Yeah. Well, I, I, I said, why can't we do this on a national level? So we organized the districts and all the section officers and all the, as many physicians as we could and told them to get your patients, to use your phone, you pay for the message, and you call the White House. After about three days, I got a call <laughs> from, from Dee Dee Meyer, <laughs> first time I'd talked to her then, and she says, Dr. Hollis, I said, yes. She says, if you will have people quit calling the White House, you will be in the primary care group. Says, we can't call out. Every time we add telephones, you're blocking the whole telephone system. I says, I'll, I'll thank you very much. I'll thank you. Appreciate that. We'll notify. So that's, that's how we got in. And then uh, I had some interesting experiences that probably the, one of the funniest things that happened was the first time I met Donna Shalala. And uh, you remember Kathy, Brian, says, now you've mm -hmm. got to be careful. You've got a, a young P's and Q's. She's 20 minutes behind. She's strictly business. And so we go in to meet with her. Well, Phil Lee was there. And it's his, her assistant, you mm -hmm. remember. I know Internist. I don't know that he ever practiced. Yeah. But he started in about primary care, primary care. Well. Donna took her glasses off, she took her watch off, put it there, and she started rubbing her temples. So some of them were talking about primary care, and I said, boy, this is bad. And he made the statement, says, you know, what you really need to learn something about is rural health care. And I made a statement that later on I was told I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> I said, I'd like to debate that point. And it got just, you could hear a pin drop all the way to the Washington line. So then I told him where I practiced, the experiences we had, what rural health care really was, mm -hmm. what it needed. And then Donna put her glass back on, her watch back on. She started, and then she started asking me questions. And we spent 40 minutes with her as we started to leave. And she's very short, you know. She says, Dr. Hollis, I've learned more about rural health care <laughs> this afternoon from you than I have from any white paper, any book, or anything anybody has told me on my staff. And without thinking, I put my arm around and I said, well, Donna, honey, anytime you want to <laughs> call me, you let me know. And then I said, oh, my goodness, I'm supposed to call you Madam Secretary. Doc, she says, you call me anything you want to. <laughs> And from that point on, every time I saw her, she was very nice to me and wanted to know about rural health care. So we made a friend with her, although uh, Dr. Lee left in a huff. But uh, that was one of the funniest things that yeah. happened. Well, I'm sure she remembered you. Well, she did. And, uh, what what uh, things are you doing now that uh, well, uh, you've accomplished almost everything we could imagine? <laughs> so. Well, I, I, I had to retire because I, I fell and injured my hip. And I've had a hip replacement. But uh, I've still been busy at home. And uh, uh, I, I will say this, the, the hospital called, the, the chief of, well, the chairman of the board called me up and wanted me to come to the hospital one day. And I says, well, okay, Herman. We'd grown up together. Got me in his office and said, we want to do something. I said, what? So we want to name us the OB wing after good, you. Good. I said, well, Herman is my doctor. Told you something. Y'all don't name anything by it till they die. He said, we <laughs> want to do it while you're living. So now they've got the Richard S. Hollis Women's Center. And, and they've had, we've had some activity with that, which has been tremendous, tremendous. And, it's, uh, a, it's a great career. It oh, is it indeed. Is. And, uh, but then the, the pediatrician that I talked to you about, 
uh, started me, got me involved in the Methodist health care system in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And I was on the trustees and the directors. And then last year, about uh, a year ago this April, the asked, they asked me if I would serve as chairman of the board. They had never had a physician in that capacity. They'd always had business people. Mm -hmm. I said, well, we'll, we'll take a shot at it. So uh, I, it takes me about 2 hours and 15 minutes to drive to Memphis. And if it were not for a computer and fax machine and cell phone, <laughs> I'd have to move up there. Because uh, we have seven hospitals, 10,000 employees, and a $1 billion a year mm -hmm. annual budget. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing another side of me medicine. Yes. I'm very busy, and uh, I, there have been times when I could, I could see they were the overlooking the physician's viewpoint, and I can see times when the physicians were being just a little more aggressive mm -hmm. than they should. So it's worked out real good, and it's kept me very busy. Well, I think it's the, uh, <coughs> the, one of the high points in really a great career. Is that we, we have an expression in our family which says uh, there are real doctors. I think you're a real doctor. <laughs> so. I've been a lucky doctor. The greatest thing in the world, Warren, I promise you, and you know this, the greatest blessing in the world is to be a physician. There's no question about it. I, if I had to do over again, I'd do it a thousand times. And I, I, I've talked to, I've talked to a couple of students today and told them how much, how wonderful it is, especially OBGYN. Thanks for being a part of us. Thank you.